without further ado, I'd like to welcome current college student Olivia Krulchek to the stage. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to come here and share my story with you all. It's so nice to be in a room full of so many like-minded individuals. It's like a breath of fresh air, and I love it. Thank you, Kim and Marshy, for this opportunity. So my name is Olivia, and I am a 20-year-old chemistry student at the University of Cincinnati. This summer, I enrolled in several classes with the intention of speeding up my graduation timeline. And one of these classes fulfilled my university's DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion requirements for graduation. My, half of my grade for this course was a project on feminism. My project was focused on the rights and opportunities that women have had in athletics throughout time. And when I received my grade, I was beyond shocked. I received zero credit, zero percent for my work. For using the term biological woman, that's why I was failed. <laughs> my professor stated that it was exclusionary, transphobic, and contributed to heteronormativity and therefore failed me. After emailing back and forth with my professor, it became very clear that she simply did not agree with the topic that I chose to write about. I chose to write about the very real fact that men are taking away opportunities from women each and every day that we allow them in our competitions, our locker rooms, and other spaces. I decided to take this to social media where I knew someone would hear me and help me. And I also filed a free speech complaint with my university. <laughs> After weeks upon weeks of nagging the administration, I finally had my grade changed by a different professor. And the University of Cincinnati formally reprimanded my professor for her violation of the free speech campus policy. <laughs> However, a couple days after my story died down on social media, they reversed this reprimand quietly. It didn't tell anyone. <laughs> yeah, my professor got away with the suppression of free speech. And this is an injustice to all current and future students and to women. The University of Cincinnati is affirming that using the term biological woman is transphobic, harmful, and outdated, and that professors will face no consequences for dis failing dissenting opinions in their classroom. I recognize the threat of losing the rights that women have fought so hard for, and I recognize the threat of losing the right to free speech that is so fundamental to our democracy. We've reached the point where students are not permitted to mention the name Riley Gaines without being failed. We're not allowed to differentiate between males and females without risking failing classes that cost us thousands of dollars. It's our duty to fight for what is right, regardless of who we may offend or who might feel offended. It's our responsibility as women to stand up for the generation of girls who will one day become the great athletes and scholars like you all in this room today. For all of them and for the women who before us secured the rights that we risk losing today, we must not sit back and let women become erased. I feel fortunate to go from writing about biological women in sports to sharing a stage with those same athletes today. Holly Levesser is a professional cyclist and masters national champion. She has won 32 professional races in a sport that has attracted a particularly high number of trans-identifying male athletes. After the sponsors of her cycling team publicly announced that they expected all members of the team to be supportive of these trans-identified athletes, Holly chose to leave the team and now competes without a sponsor. So please welcome Holly. Kylie Alons is a 31-time All-American swimmer, two-time NCAA champion, five-time ACC champion, former American record holder, and the most decorated swimmer in North Carolina State women's swimming program history. <laughs> Riley Gaines is a 12-time All-American swimmer, a four-time SEC champion, an SEC record holder, and female scholar athlete of the year. She's an advisor to the Independent Women's Forum and has postponed other career opportunities to advocate full-time for female athletes. <laughs> Paula Scanlon is a graduate of the University of Pennsylvania where she was a member of the women's swim team and a teammate of Leah Thomas. She has recently begun to speak out about the treatment of the women's team at the Ivy League.
And now I'd like to introduce the moderator of this panel of athletes, Pamela Pereski. She's a social psychologist with a clinical background who authored the guided journal, A Year of Kindness, and served as chief researcher and in-house editor for New York Times bestseller, The Coddling of the American Mind. Her work has appeared in a diverse array of publications, including Psychology Today, The Guardian, and The New York Times. She has taught at several institutions, including Johns Hopkins, the University of Chicago, and the US Air Force Academy, and is a consultant of the Open Therapy Institute. Her current project is titled, Habits of a Free Mind, Psychology for Democracy and the Good Life. Thank you all. Hi. Wasn't Olivia amazing? She didn't tell you this, but she was very nervous. And um, she also didn't tell you, she was a high school runner and she broke her back and had to quit competing. Um, so this is part of why she wrote about female sports. Um, and also, since we have um, just come back from lunch and I'm sure this is like the doldrums time, how about everybody just stand up and stretch for a sec and applaud for Olivia. <laughs> <laughs> I, I also want to say that these four athletes, the other young women here, and Olivia, they're all um, probably you have the same. I you know it makes me emotional. Um, they give me hope. Um, Olivia had courage. She had the courage to acknowledge biology and to stand up for freedom of speech. And it's insane that it takes courage for those things. Um, but it does. And it gives me hope that all of the young women here have had that kind of courage. They, uh, they understand that being afraid to speak is not freedom. Being untruthful is not kind and being coerced is not consent. We've heard a lot of things at this conference and uh, including what we heard just before lunch about institutional capture uh, and there's a lot more to come. Um, but one of the things that strikes me is this inverted illiberal story that shows up in different ways in our culture right now, including with women's sports. So I'm gonna just tell you a little bit about this story. For hundreds, if not thousands of years, one group was subjugated by another. Fictional and defamatory views about this subjugated group meant they were only allowed in certain spaces and could only work in certain professions. Its members were even blamed for illnesses and misfortunes, leading to public executions, like being burned at the stake. Over time, as understanding truth replaced believing fiction, members of the subjugated group were afforded the right to self-determination. They were afforded their own spaces. There was wide se widespread support for this, and it was generally accepted that this was both morally right and based in fact. They no longer felt subjugated in their own space. Recently, however, an illiberal ideology has taken hold that turns everything upside down. Now maintaining boundaries both for safety and for fairness, is considered offensive. This ideology holds that self-determination for this group is a form of bigotry against members of a group who claim the right to determine what it means to be in those exclusive spaces. Instead of widespread outrage at this inverted and illiberal and truth-denying fiction, as we've heard from Ramey and Jen and others, and we'll hear again, Female athletes are told to keep quiet when competition is unfair and are required to ignore that little voice that tells them that something is wrong. They're trained to stop listening to their instincts. If they mention feeling distressed about boundaries not being respected, they're told they aren't a good teammate. They're told they could be responsible for a suicide. So I'm gonna show you a slide on the right is a quote by a female swimmer who was ranked third 
uh, in the race in which Leah was ranked first. And I want you to think about when Dr. Dina McMillan speaks next, how did this highly ranked swimmer come to believe that her accomplishments and fair competition for female athletes were not only less important then, but an affront to treating people with respect and dignity. Below that is part of an email sent to female swimmers at Harvard that Riley tweeted not long ago. Swimmers at Harvard were emotionally manipulated into believing that if they weren't supportive of including trans-identified male athletes in women's sports, they could be responsible for a suicide. They were told that their feelings of frustration didn't matter. Even winning didn't matter if they didn't have the approved feelings. And they were supposed to keep their mouths shut. On the left is a sign I saw on Twitter this morning, thanks to John Kay, a, a journalist. It says, please use the space you feel best aligns with your gender and needs. In other words, if trans-identified females feel that their needs, as opposed to the way they conceive of their gender, are best served by using a female space, they're welcome. Trans-identified males who claim woman as their gender are also welcome. But also, a male who identifies as a man, but has some subjective need to be in a woman's restroom is also welcome. And yes, it also means that women can use the men's restroom if they so choose, which I guess is good because not only are the lines shorter, it might be the safest place for women now. <laughs> but look at the second line. Who is the audience? Who is being reminded that everyone is entitled to respect, dignity, and privacy? What do you think the reaction would be if a woman complained that a trans-identified male in this female space violated her dignity or privacy by not respecting her boundaries. Female athletes are expected to say nothing when their boundaries are dismissed and disregarded, even when a nude male body is allowed into spaces they once relied on for privacy, and even when they are forced to undress in front of a male athlete. If they have a problem with any of this, they're told they are the problem. They should seek help. We're now supposed to pretend that including trans-identified males in female spaces and male athletes in women's sports is a step forward for civil rights rather than a step backwards for women's rights. Women's sports are known to build confidence and self-regard and have until now provided the freedom for female athletes to compete on a level and safe playing field. Women's sports have historically been associated with women being less susceptible to domestic abuse, except, as Jen Say noted, when female athletes are abused in their sport. After Dr. McMillan's presentation, you'll hear from these four extraordinary athletes whose stories will illustrate how women are being psychologically manipulated in ways that could make them more susceptible. When you listen to Dr. McMillan, ask yourself how it's possible that so many policies prioritize the feelings and aspirations of those trans-identified male athletes rather than feelings and experiences of every female athlete who has trained and sacrificed and persisted in order to compete fairly against other female athletes. Dr. Dina McMillan is a Stanford-trained social psychologist who specializes in domestic violence. She's the author of the book, But He Says He Loves Me, which is in print in 14 countries and is available as an audiobook. Her program, Unmasking the Abuser, reveals the tactics abusers use to lure their targets into toxic relationships and prevent them from leaving. What you will hear from her is disturbing, both because she explains how easily abusers use benign cultural expectations and social norms to victimize girls and women and because the parallels between female athletes in today's environment and victims of violent abuse are chilling. As she said yesterday from the audience, this gave me goosebumps, how do you get people to deny reality? One step at a time. Dr. Dina McMillan.
Thank you, everyone. And as you heard, I'm a social psychologist. A lot of people don't know what that is. Social psychology is the scientific study of power dynamics and influence and per persuasion. Over the past 15 years, I've been using that lens to examine abusive relationships. I recognized that not only do abusers use a number of these dynamics with their victims, they're very skilled at using manipulation on other people, those who would try to protect their victims. My work, therefore, prepares people to recognize the patterns of abuse. This helps vi victims leave their abusive relationships and it allows potential targets to recognize the signs and avoid becoming victims. I also work in the policy space to help society shape systems and structures that can prevent abusers from gaining access to, pot to potential victims. During my decades of research and work in this field, I've interviewed more than 5,000 people who were victims of abuse and more than 700 abusers. The abusers I interviewed were extremely open. They knew exactly what they were doing. They told me how they'd get away with it. For the most part, they were right because the people around them expected them to play fair, to express honest emotions, and to keep their word. And abusers counted on that. The reason I'm speaking to you today is because what's happening in women's sports bears a troubling resemblance to what I see in abusive relationships. Let me be clear that I am not implying that coaches or others who have authority in women's sports are intentionally hurting female athletes. On the contrary, because I know manipulators are masterful at maneuvering others into becoming part of a system that enables their abuse. They lay the groundwork well. As a result of their cunning, those who care about the victim often find themselves going to great lengths to defend the abuser. They either can't admit they've been manipulated, or they fear the abuse will worsen, or even that they'll become targets themselves if they don't go along. As a general rule, men who abuse women take advantage of cultural norms that begin in early childhood and re are reinforced over time. These include teaching girls to prioritize being nice over all other qualities, to consider others before themselves, to give everyone a second chance, to make compromises in order to take care of other people's feelings even when it isn't in their own self-interest. Girls are taught early to respect authority and are often punished more harshly than their brothers if they break the rules. Whatever you think about these cultural norms, when girls and women learn them well, it can make them targets for abuse. What I'm seeing in women's sports is particularly alarming. Instead of putting in place policies that protect girls and women from abuse, people in a positions of authority and the organizations responsible for women's sports are enacting policies that subject women to some of the same tactics abusers use on their victims. As a result, female athletes are being trained to develop the same mental habits that abusers develop in their victims. This is especially concerning because women who develop the mental habits that allow them to be victimized by abusers are significantly more likely to be re-victimized in other relationships romantic and otherwise. The ways in which female athletes are expected to include trans identifying male athletes in formerly sex segregated spaces and competitions constitutes the preconditioning necessary to become future victims of abusive relationships of all kinds. So even if you think the current treatment of female athletes is somehow justified 
even for the time they spend participating in sports, it cannot be justified to train girls and women to develop the mental habits of abuse victims. That can have a lasting and potentially devastating effect. I'm going to share a set of core tactics used by domestic abusers. The similarities between what abusers do to their targets and what's been happening to female athletes will be apparent. The influence tactics used by abusers begin with testing and training. Abusers test their romantic target. They do things that make their target uncomfortable to see how she responds. The specifics vary, but not the goal. Invade a woman's personal space, breach her personal boundaries, and train her to accept it all without complaint, even with a smile. What do I mean by training? At the same time the abuser's testing, he's also psychologically conditioning his romantic target. Every time the abuser does something that crosses a line and she allows him to get away with it, she's rewarded. If she resists or even hesitates, she's punished. He does something to hurt her feelings and make her feel small, dismissed, and disempowered. This is how abusers gain control of their victim's speech and behavior. Targets quickly learn to give in to the abuse, and their abusers often convince them that the abusive treatment is for their own good. Victims of abuse even adopt their abuser's justifications for what's occurring. When friends or family are worried, the victim defends it using the scripted explanations they've been taught. Abusers convince their victims that if they feel uncomfortable with anything he does or demands, her discomfort is her problem. There's something wrong with her. When I described all that, did any light bulbs go off? Did you see the parallels between what abusers do in these relationships and what's being asked of our female athletes when they're expected to allow male athletes into their sports and spaces? When we hear girls explaining away the loss of fair competition, rationalizing why their accomplishments shouldn't be prioritized, we should recognize immediately that they've been conditioned, indoctrinated, and taught to surrender. Is this what we want for the women in this world? To be easy prey for abusers? To lose out not only in sports, but in every area of their lives because they've been conditioned to submit to manipulation and exploitation? To not stand up for themselves? To never say no? I don't, and I expect you don't either. I'm Dr. Dina McMillan. If you want more information on my work, including the strategy and tactics of abusers I discuss here, please contact me on my website, www.drdinamcmillan.com. Thank you for listening. Well, uh, while they're removing the podium, um, I'll just note that I watched the faces of everybody and um, I think it landed. Um, thank you. Uh, I, I have been talking to Kim about this concern for quite a while, but I don't have the background in domestic abuse and, and strategies and tactics that Dr. McMillan has, and so having her here to talk about that has been so helpful. Um, now I'm gonna turn to these four athletes who were subjected to those very same techniques and ask, um, and ask what they see. I'm gonna start with Holly. Holly is a cyclist, um, as you heard in her introduction. And, um, and um, Holly told me, Tell everybody about how you would choose races. About, man, four years ago, 
I became aware that locally there were males starting to sign up in the female category. And I kind of banded together with three friends where we would discuss it because we all were in agreement. And we basically started trying to avoid this one individual that raced the series all of us were used to racing. Um, over the years, more have popped up. It's become more difficult. But sometimes you can see start lists who's registered beforehand, so we'd comb them. We would look at um, their social media to try to get an idea of what races they may talk about that they were training for. But the whole intention was that we didn't want to race against males. And there were some races where they would hide the, yeah. Yeah, this past December at Cyclocross Nationals, which is a type of biking, um, they actually hid names of males entered in women's races from the start lists. So all of our names were still visible, but you wouldn't know signing up that a male was in your race. Um, yeah. So, and one of the things that you had told me about was the distress that you felt in watching online the, the comments um, about the male athletes' wins that were being, like, female athletes were cheering them on. And t just t talk a little bit about that. Yeah. After, I mean, the most notable name that people know is Austin Killips. And the posts on Instagram, if you would go and read them after, you know, a win or a placement that was high, there were so many women that were either in the race or were cyclists cheering him on, applauding him, um, his for being brave, for getting out there. And I just didn't get it. And you know, you'd read down through, you know, the 50th comment, and I would start feeling like, what is wrong? What am I what am I missing here? Like, am I wrong for feeling this isn't right or fair? And I mean Long term, I didn't think that way, but in a moment, I would feel so defeated and like, is there something wrong with me? And it was like, I would have to go back to the people who knew this was unfair and just, I guess, get support, get re-energized. But you start thinking, is there something wrong? Am I the only person that sees this isn't fair? That's partly a function of not enough people speaking up about it. Um, that's you know, when people don't speak up, there's a, a, a social psychology term, preference falsification. That's when people pretend they, that they have preferences they don't have. So they, they falsely assert having certain kinds of views. Um, so they either just stay quiet or sometimes even will, you know, say, I would guess that some of the people who were posting positive things didn't feel positive, though many of them may have. Um, and then um, your teams stopped paying for your uh, bike maintenance. Yeah, I was part of a local club or team. And when I first joined the team, because I was one of the best mountain bikers in the state, they wanted me on their team. So they gave me perks. And one of them was free labor on my bikes and discounts. And this continued um, for years, and we didn't really talk about the arrangement after it was set up. And going into 2022, I noticed that they started getting charged for labor. And I brought it up just, you know, they had new employees thinking maybe this got missed. They don't know the arrangement. And I was told, no, the shop could no longer afford to support me. But they did this without telling me. And I had to awkwardly ask, you know, what's going on? 
And from there, and what I guess I didn't mention is in 2021, I had been on the podium with a male. I had beat him, which I don't think matters, but had to stand up there. And I did not put my arms up, as is traditional when you're on the cycling podium. I kind of frowned, had my arms down. And there were a couple pictures of that. And so I do know that my team would have seen those pictures. And my belief is that that's what prompted the labor to stop. And I don't know if you then want you me got to keep an email, going. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I then, after asking about the labor, several weeks later, got an email telling me that the team's position on transgender racing in cycling, their position would be coming out. So an email comes out to the whole team, and it talks about how the team is fully supporting being inclusive. We want to have transgender participation in cycling, which is something I agree with, but just not in the female category. Um, we were told that, or yeah, I guess all of us on the team were told that we need to support this. Um, it's, we should not be bullying and singling out anyone at a race. I guess it, it felt very much like it was implied that's what I did. And they just said at the end that they hoped their position was clear and that we would be in agreement. And then you left the team. Yeah, within a couple of days, I decided to quit. Um, <laughs> yeah, I couldn't go on racing for something I didn't believe in, even if it meant like giving up all the perks, which I don't even know that I had anymore. <laughs> so th this is a pretty clear example of exactly what Dr. McMillan was talking about. And... Um, uh, and, and the messages that women get, you know, this message, your access to fair competition doesn't matter over and over. If, if you think differently, there's something wrong with you. Um, I think uh, this is similar, Paula, to what um, the messages that you got at Penn. Um, your team was... Um, was told that, you, well, you were on the team before Will transitioned to Leah, so you knew that this was gonna happen, yeah. Yeah, I did. Um, and then there were 16 anonymous members of the team who um, made a statement that they were not in favor of this. Um, and then there was a big meeting. Can you just talk about that? Yeah, I'm not sure when the, the letter came in regard, in regards to the meeting, but it was, uh, led by Nancy, who's sitting over there. So she helped out with that. So we were really appreciative of. <laughs> um, and uh, also just Donna uh, is a close family friend of mine. And so prior to any of this happening, I, I had talked to her deeply about what was going on. Um, and in this time, no one really knew about it because there was no large scale competition where it was very obvious that there was a male competing, right? Because swimming is not a super popular sport, especially at the NCAA level. Obviously, everyone watches the Olympics, but no one really watches the NCAA level of swimming, other than, uh, you know, the, the year that, that this happened. But, um, yeah, and um, what had happened was is our team and the athletic department ignored the issue for a really, really long time, as long as they could. And it wasn't until the midseason meet in December where the media started to get involved, and that was when the athletic department came in and said there was a mandatory meeting for all athletes on the team. Except Leah. Except Leah, yes. So Leah was notably told to not attend the meeting, which I thought was very interesting. Um, and in this meeting, they told us that we would regret speaking to the media if we did, and it would ruin our chances at getting a job, it would follow you for the rest of your life, and that's not something you would want. And additionally, in this meeting, they also provided 
a member of the school psychological services, and they said, we are here to help you make you okay with this. Here's counseling services so you feel okay with the, um, the idea of having a male on your team. And in this meeting, they also made it very clear to us that Leah Swimming was a non-negotiable. They just said, they said those exact words at the very beginning of the meeting. They said Leah Swimming is a non-negotiable. So they said, we're here to help you talk about how to be comfortable with it, but the debate of whether or not this male is gonna be on the team, that's not gonna happen because we've already decided that this is gonna happen and it's gonna happen for the rest of the season. And also at this meeting was somebody from the LGBTQ Center, right? Yeah, they brought in some leader from the LGBTQ Center. I didn't know who they were, um, but they just sat there and told us that it's very important to be inclusive and that the situation is an inclusivity problem. And um, they also then tried to set up follow-up meetings with the team with the LGBT Center. Um, I don't know how many people attended those. I was, I was not in attendance, but they, uh, they did try to do that as well. And then... Um, you said the athletic director started attending your practices, right? Yeah, so actually after this, they sent someone from the athletic department to our training trip to come oversee all of our practices. And then they would always come on deck for all of our meets and all of our practices. And prior to this, uh, the athletic department never cared about the swim team. It was never one of their priorities. Um, but they made it very clear that they were watching over us. It felt very much like someone was just there standing there to make it clear that they saw you and they wanted to make sure that the message that they gave in that meeting at the beginning of December was clear and we were constantly reminded of it for the remainder of the season. So much of this is just surreal. Um, how were you informed that Leah was going to be in the locker room with you? We were never told this formally. Um, at the beginning, when we first were when it was first announced in the fall of 2019 that Will Thomas, and again at the time was not named Leah, was going to be transitioning, we were told we would talk about the locker room, that maybe there would be a, a family locker room or an additional space. We were told everyone was going to be comfortable, but once the season started, Leah had a name on the lockers like anyone else did, and it was never up for debate or discussion whatsoever. And anyone who brought it up just said, Leah is a member of the women's team. Leah will have all the privileges any member of the women's team will have. It sounds like a lot of this like, put together was very intimidating. So um, it's not surprising that the athletes who spoke out at all did it anonymously. Um, there was one, one person who spoke out by name. Is that right? I don't recall. Like during the season? Against it or for it? Against it. No, Against no, no it. one nobody did during did. the season. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, during the season, nobody did. Um, and so, um, again, like these intimidation tactics, um, they send the message, your thoughts don't matter, your feelings don't matter, fair competition for you does not matter. You have to put yourself behind the male. Um, and now... You, you can speak out because you're not afraid. Um, I, another, um, Kylie also mentioned that one of the things that her team was told um, had to do with being a good team player, right? Being a good teammate. And so talk about a little bit what you feared about speaking out. Yeah, I mean, I think kind of the whole idea, the whole lie that we all kind of bought into was that you couldn't speak out about this, you couldn't have an opinion about it, you couldn't say anything about your feelings about having to share a locker room with a male, having to compete against a male, and be a good and supportive and loving teammate at the same time. And obviously now that I'm out of it, I realize that that was a lie, and just, just even the fact that there was a lot of silence around this topic that made it even hard for me to share my feelings, fed into this idea that I needed to put my team first, I needed to go to the NCAAs, I needed to get points for the team, we have team goals, we need, want to get a team trophy, like, we need to focus all of the attention on that, and anything that takes away from that is hurting the team. Yeah, that's similar to what the Harvard students were, were told in that email. And both of you were in the position of needing to change. Um, Riley, you never had to share the locker room, right? I did. You did? I did. Uh, all of you. So all of, all of them in the position of having to change in front of a male body. Um, and so this is... a 
a matter of now thinking about something you never had to think about before, trying to get change while covered is what you were telling me. And then Kylie, you found uh, a room, a, a janitor's storage or something room. Talk about that. Yeah, so a little bit of background about swimming is that we wear these racing suits, these uniforms. They are skin tight, paper thin. They can take a really long time to get on. And so when you are at a big swim meet, you spend a lot of time in the locker room. You're changing out of your, in and out of your practice suit to go do your warm ups, and then you're changing in and out of your racing suit because you have to only wear it for your race because they um, can only last so long. And so, yeah, I was faced with this situation, me and Riley both, where we had to change in the locker room where Leah could also be changing. And I changed in there the first day and I was incredibly uncomfortable, incredibly on edge, even when he wasn't in there. And the way that I handled it was to actually change in the storage closet that was behind my team's bleachers. And obviously it wasn't as nice as the locker room. There was a lot of equipment in there and it was dark, but I was at, in that moment, I was just so thankful that I had a private place to change, even if it was a storage closet. And th this is a, this, that particular thing really struck me, that, that you were in a position where you felt grateful to have a closet to change in. This, this was very striking, and again, really reinforces for me the emotional manipulation that is very similar to being a, a victim of abuse that you start to become grateful for the days you're not hit, for example. Um, and, um, and then at the, uh, talk about the t-shirts, the Title IX t-shirts. Oh, I should have brought it down here. <laughs> oh, I, I have that. it with me. <laughs> uh, yeah, so partially during the meet, uh, I don't remember what day it was, but we were leaving a prelim session and the NCAA staff was handing out all of these t-shirts and, you know, of course picked one up and was looking at it as I was going out of the pool and just, you know, to my horror, it says celebrating celebrating 50 years of Title IX on it, and I'm just like, is this like is this like a joke? I, I just didn't really understand, um, you know, what the point of handing out T-shirts about Title IX, which was created to give women a part opportunity to compete at the very meet that they were going against that entire principle. The inversions are everywhere, Riley. Was that the race at which you were first aware that there would be a male in your locker room? Um, this was my first time being directly in that space, but I became aware of Leah Thomas earlier in the season um, and, and how I became aware of Thomas. It's very different than, than Paula, who has, had been on a team with Will and knew this was happening in 2019. So she dealt with this, this process for three years, okay? I didn't find out about this until November of 2021, where... Um, I was competing for a national championship. I had made it my goal to become a national champion in the 200 freestyle. And about middle of the season, I was right on pace to achieve that by the end of the season. Um, I was ranked a few one hundredths of a second behind the girl who was, who was in second place in the country. Um, but this name, who was leading the country by body lengths, I had never heard of. And that was the first time I became aware of a swimmer named Leah Thomas. Um, a lot of head scratching. I, I had never heard this name. They were a senior. They were from University of Pennsylvania, which doesn't historically put swimmers in that position to achieve. Sorry, Paula. No, to it's, achieve it's a national championship. True. It's completely true. Kentucky doesn't either. So, so there's no there's no slamming there. Um, UK is not known for that. Um, schools like NC State are. Um, but I was just like, who is this person who's leading the country again by body lengths? And in swimming, this is a sport that's measured down to the hundredth of a second. Like I mentioned, I was in third hundredths of a second behind the girl who was in second. Um, so to have this person leading by body lengths, it didn't make sense until an article came out. Um, and in this article, in a blip of a sentence, as if we were supposed to just read right over it, it says, Leah Thomas is formerly Will Thomas and swam three years on the men's team at University of Pennsylvania before deciding to switch to the women's team, and then carried on, as if it, it didn't say that. Um, and so I read this, and I was so shocked. Um, of course, I was shocked, but really I felt a sense of relief because then I was able to look up who Will Thomas was because I was curious. There was a sense of intriguement almost. Who is this person? Is this a lateral movement? Did this person go from ranking at the top to now continuing to rank at the top? 
which is, of course, not what we saw. We saw that the year prior, Thomas competing against the men ranked 462nd at best, meaning he's mediocre when competing against the men, to now dominating against the women. So that was the first time I became aware of Leah Thomas. And again, this is November of 2021, and that national championships wasn't until March of 2022. Uh, so there's a few months in between. But in those months, my experience is pretty different than Paula and Kylie's because I was team captain of my team. And I made it clear from the beginning of this that I would facilitate these conversations, not in a way that made anyone feel pressured to agree with what I was saying, but I wanted everyone to know they could freely say how they felt. Again, regardless of if it was in agreement with me or not. But what I found on my team was of the 40 girls... 38 of them agreed with me, and two of them did not. Um, and I think that speaks volumes. I think that is much more indicative of, of how the population at whole really is represented. Um, 38 of us were on the same page, which, was, which allowed us to be able to talk freely about it with our coaches, and to which my coaches agreed with me, to which then he was able to talk about it with our athletic director, and our athletic director was in full support of our stance. And so I just made it clear um, that I, I knew I, I was in a position of, of leadership amongst our team, and I would, I would make sure that no one felt silenced. Um, so I felt, I, and I, I think this speaks too of why I kind of felt comfortable and confident in speaking out earlier, is because I had that support. I had that support from my team, from my family. I didn't lose any friends over this. I never felt canceled. Um, by any means. And when I called my athletic director to tell him that I was going to really ask him, I asked him, you know, like, this is what happened. This is how we feel. How do you feel if we speak out? And again, he knew how, how we felt. And he said, Riley, I love you. I support you. He said, I would support whatever stance you took, but speak your heart. I will never forget him saying, speak your heart. It gives me chills. He said, speak your heart, stay true to your convictions, and don't worry about painting this university in a bad light because we're behind you. And I will never... I just think that's a testament of what support and kind of that backing, even though it was minimal, right? All he was saying is the bare minimum, right? It goes back to, we wanted the bare minimum for asking for a safe place to undress. We're asking for the bare minimum, and he gave me that bare minimum of saying, I love you, and, and I'm here for you. This is what every female athlete ought to be able to expect, like you said, as bare minimum, that you are entitled to your own opinions. You are entitled to your own thoughts, and nobody is going to shut you up. And I, when he told me this, I did think nothing of it, because that is what I expected. I thought nothing of him saying... I speak your heart, stay true to your convictions. Really, I hung up the phone. Okay, thanks, bye. I thought nothing of it, not a thing. When did you realize that this was a really unusual kind of attitude on the part of the, the support people around you? When girls began reaching out to me privately by the thousands after this meet, girls who were on that pool deck, Olympians, a lot of really, really, really well-known names um, outside of even just the sport of swimming, male, female athletes, coaches, coaches would reach out to me privately. Me, a 22-year-old girl at the time who had, actually 21-year-old girl at the time who had no idea what I was doing, they were reaching out to me and saying, thank you for doing this. And at first, I, I still didn't realize those messages came in, and I kind of felt honored. I felt pretty humbled by this, you know, like there's a lot of support here. But then came the backlash. Um, then came the name calling, and I kind of look to those people like, hey guys, I'm getting a lot of this name calling. Who wants to take some <laughs> with me? <laughs> and no one would. <laughs> and so that's when I kind of began asking the question of why, uh, right? The, this, this groundbreaking question of why, you know, like why, why not? And then that's when I realized the silencing measures and, and this isn't to say that I didn't face any. I did. I had to go to media training. I had to learn how to use she, her pronouns through my university. Um, they told, and I'm sure we can get into this in a bit. So, so there were some silencing tactics. Um, but I, I didn't realize how thankful I was for my athletic department and my university and really the SEC at large um, until I started having those conversa conversations and people like Paula 
began sharing with me what they went through. It, it really speaks to the importance of having a support system that um, allows people in positions where saying something, I mean, this is, a, this is an area in which you immediately become very unpopular when you say certain things. And people know this, and not a lot of people are willing to be unpopular, or at least not that unpopular. Um, not a lot of people have the kind of support system, and certainly not, a, apparently not a lot of female athletes had the kind of support system that Riley had, and especially not at the Ivies, where they were given you know, lots of daily doses of the opposite message. Um, it's important to recognize that the bullies win when people don't speak up. Uh, this has been a, 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 um, a theme this whole, this whole conference. Jennifer Say said this, people the, yesterday said, it is important to speak up. But the thing that people don't recognize is the more people speak up, the less courage it takes to speak up. And once there is a tipping point, everything goes in the other direction. And all the people here are waiting for that tipping point, right? Because it's, I, I want you to think about what happened to Harvey Weinstein. For years, he was able to uh, get away with all kinds of horrible behavior because when one woman spoke up, she could be dealt with. But at a certain point, one woman spoke up and then quickly another one and then quickly another one and then there were 80 women and he could not do away with them and they won. And that is what needs to happen here. I'm gonna ask one more question and then we're gonna throw it out uh, to, to the audience for questions. But the question is, you have all dealt with being told not to speak to the media, not to speak out on this. And Riley, tell us about that experience that you had. Yeah, so like I mentioned, um, we became aware of this middle of my senior season. And all of my three years prior competing at the NCAA championships, which again, it's, it's really the fastest meet in the world, um, short course especially. These are, this is, it's the highest level in college swimming. Um, it's your meet you train all year for. And I think we can all agree swimming is not a sport that garners that media attention. So naturally, we wouldn't have media training. Um, but my senior year, about two or so weeks before our national championships, um, we had our sports information director come to our practice and say, all of the NCAA qualifiers, you know, come with me. We're doing media training. So I'm like, this is weird. Why? OK. Um, they must expect some big, pretty big things from us. And so I go into this room, and she sits us down, and she has a slideshow, and, and essentially get to the point of it is she's teaching us how to use pronouns correctly, or I would say incorrectly. And so I was so shocked by this. Me, again, being 21 years old, a senior in college studying human health sciences, taking all the organic chemistries and the biologies and genetics and, and all of the hard classes, and they're teaching me how to use pronouns. I'm like, this isn't even something you learn in school because you don't have to. This is something you just know, yet I'm a, in, a senior in college and they're teaching me this. And I, I made it very clear, I don't understand why we're here. Um, Ultimately, that's when they had a meeting with only the freestylers, which would be the only people directly competing against Thomas, to reinforce the importance of this. And they told us that if any, any media requests come our way, we had to send it to them. Uh, no, n nothing, any, nothing else. Just if you get any media requests, send it to us and we'll help you. So I was like, okay. And of course, this, this meet did get a lot of media attention where there was reporters and on all sides, left-leaning, right-leaning, everything in between, who were there desperately hoping to get a quote from someone that they and could this take. this was the meet that you tied. Right, yes. Um, desperately hoping they could take back to their publisher and be like, hey, look, I did it. Um, but no one would provide them a quote. Um, but my inbox was filled. They would find your name on the heat sheet. And I, I think after Thomas and I tied in the 200, um, 
they were like, we need to get a quote from her. And so my inbox was filled. And so I started forwarding them to my sports information director, like she told us to do. And she responded back. She texted me back and she said, thanks. I declined them for you. And I was like, (laughs) that was never the agreement. Um, I didn't ask you to do that. You told us to forward these to you because you would help us respond. Um, And she responded back and said, remember our conversation and remember the name you wear on your shirts or on your swimsuit or on your cap and remember who you represent. Um, And I want to say, I think the first time that I learned, and again, what made this easy, easier, I shouldn't say easy, easier for me, the first time I learned how to to stick up for myself um, in terms of these higher authorities was during COVID. Um, We were told we had to get the vaccine. Um, We were told if you don't get the, it was very similar tactics. If you don't get the vaccine, then this, or all of these silly things that, that in my head, didn't add up. You can't make me do something. Um, And kind of more out of defiance than anything, I said, no, um, I won't be getting the vaccine. That's not something you can make me do, to which they told me I wouldn't wouldn't be able to play or swim. Um, I I wouldn't be able to travel for me, especially if I didn't get it. I would spend three weeks out of the water, whereas everyone else only had to spend five days. If I didn't get it, then I had to wear my mask all the time, and, and the vaccinated individuals didn't have to wear their mask. It was all of these fear tactics. But I learned how, right then and there, how to say no. And I think that helped me here learn how to say no. You don't tell me what to do. I was a very coachable person, believe it or not. I actually was. <laughs> um, but I do think it's that, a little, that little piece of defiant in me um, that really struck me. Um, these people in authority, they were, they were overstepping their boundaries entirely, and I, I'm pretty fortunate that I was able to see it pretty clearly um, throughout the whole time. And so the media training, um, I will say at first it was hard when I did begin to speak up, like um, the pronoun issue, right? It is because I ultimately I do want to be respectful. I do want to be compassionate. I do want to handle this issue with composure and, and with understanding, but you can do that without lying. And then it, it hit me, and I did a few interviews where I, I you know, the pronoun, it was hard for me to learn. Um, but ultimately I decided it is compassionate to tell the truth, it is kind, all of those terms that we were having thrown at our face on the back of these shirts that they passed out, um, celebrating Title IX, including inclusion and welcoming and acceptance and, and all of these things. Telling the truth is those things. Lying, that's, that's the exact opposite. Um, so I won't say it wasn't hard, but I, I could see it pretty clearly. Yeah. Um, do we have a microphone for um, people who want to, because I'm sure there are a lot of people who want to ask questions. I think we do, yeah. Okay, so uh, Lisa, I see a question over there. Um, Thank you all for sharing these stories, and Pamela, you're you're really good at this. Um, Thank you. I am curious, because I'm a lot older than all of you, and was raised very hardcore lefty feminist, and I'm and I'm curious about what it's like for younger women and who grew up um, assuming rights that women in earlier generations really had to fight hard for everything from you know, not being legally raped by their husbands, to having credit cards in their own names. These are only a few decades old, these wins. Um, so I was wondering what, how, if, if any way, this changed your relationship to feminism or how you think about women's rights, and if you thought about those before this. I can start by just kind of saying it's changed my view entirely, and I, I kind of briefly funny like being kind of funny yesterday said I never thought I would be described as a feminist um, because my understanding of of feminism um, I guess I kind of had a skewed perception before all of this right because I most certainly believe men and women are created equal but I do believe we're different and so when I saw the original Me Too movement um, it, it didn't seem as if it was understanding that we were created differently um, or, or we had differences, and so I never would have thought of myself as a feminist. But now, how I call myself really is a modern-day feminist, which just means that women are entitled to respect. 
um, there are two sexes and you can't change your sex. Um, that's how I consider it. But I think this is perfectly highlighted and I mean, we could probably list several examples um, of how the tables have turned, right? From the party who once embraced feminism and to now it's, it is Republicans or the right who is kind of seizing this opportunity to, to protect women's sex-based protections and rights. But even my home state of Tennessee, we were the 36th state to pass legislation that gave women the right to vote. But now, as mentioned by Hadley yesterday, we were the second state to define what a woman is. And so I think even if you look at examples throughout history, we've seen this perception flip. Um, and I think I fall in line with kind of how that perception has flipped. It's like first wave feminism all over again. Um, yeah, we have a question here, Kara. Coming, Kara. I just want to say as I'm walking up to Kara, no matter your generation or where your allegiance is, all hail the defiant woman. Yeah. <laughs> Seriously, thank you all. This has been so great to hear your stories. Um, so my question is for Paula. Um, well, when all of this was going on, um, a woman named Amanda Stuhlman, who runs an organization called Keep Prison Single Sex, wrote an amazing, amazing letter. And I can say that because I had nothing to do with writing it. She did everything. Um, but, but she did ask me to sign it. And so I signed it both in my capacity as president of WDI USA and in my capacity as an alum of UPenn Law. So, but, but it was such a good letter because it, it was addressed to... I think it was HR at Penn, or someone in Penn, as well as the district attorney of Philadelphia, explaining all of the reasons at why Thomas ought to have been charged criminally for being in the women's locker room. Now, of course, we didn't get a response to that letter. We didn't expect a response to that letter. But I'm curious, was there ever any talk within Penn, uh, any serious talk of of bringing any kind of disciplinary charges or any kind of repercussions against Thomas? So um, I've never heard about this, so that should be enough of an answer. That was not something that was ever brought to our attention on the team. Um, no, there was never a discussion about this being something that I now, being a year and a half removed from it, understand it being sexual harassment. It is the university subjected us to sexual harassment to be in a situation where we are present with a man with male anatomy while we're undressing. It's not comfortable, and it was something that was very challenging for me. Um, I mean, I haven't talked about this a lot, but I, I had nightmares. I'm gonna get choked up. I had nightmares every single week that I was there on that team, that um, they were inviting a man to come in there and do things to us. <laughs> Sorry, I don't normally get choked up about this, but just the way you're bringing it up. Um, they subjected us to that every single day. We have two practices a day where you have to change out of your street clothes into your suit and out from your suit back into your street clothes twice a day, every single day. And they never once brought any of that to our attention that you know, we had a claim for feeling like that, it was harassment, and they just told us we needed therapy to get over that. And to this day, it's still something that in the moment, I just told myself I had to get through it. And now being removed from it, it's still so challenging for me to talk about and to think about the fact that they subjected us to that. The fact that they subjected 40 girls to being sexually harassed, and they invited for any man not just someone who identified as a woman, to be allowed to come into our spaces and to be allowed to do whatever they wanted to us and watch us unchanged for as long as they wanted. And I will say at the NCAA level, um, again, we weren't forewarned. Again, she dealt with this for three years. Um, maybe not in the locker room the entirety of that three years. I dealt with this at one meet. Um, I walked into that locker room. Again, we were not forewarned we would be sharing this changing space to seeing a six foot four. Wikipedia says six foot one. That's a lie. Um, Thomas is six foot four. A six foot four, 22 year old man undressing with male parts exposed, inches away from where we were undressing. And so I immediately left the locker room and went up to one of the NCAA officials on the pool deck and said, look, I understand the guidelines for the competition, but what are the guidelines for the locker room that allowed a male 
with male genitalia to be undressing. And this goes back to the testing and training because so nonchalantly, he responds with, oh, well, we actually got around this by making the locker rooms unisex. So first of all, this, this, was, this was my initial thought. One, by admitting you have to change the rules, you're admitting this isn't a woman. You're admitting it, and you know you are, first of all. Um, and second of all, unisex? So any, that, that picture that you had on the slide, that's what, we, that's what we went through. Any man could have walked into that locker room, not just, not just Thomas, any coach, any official, any parent, any pervert who wanted to be in that locker room had full access to it. And bare minimum, we weren't even told about this, this arrangement. Imagine that if, imagine you, you, um, you graduate from college and become a dentist and uh, you go to a dentist convention and at the convention they tell you, in order to be a dentist, you have to undress in front of one of the male dentists. I mean, nobody would put it. Imagine any other, any other situation where 40 women, or more in this, you know, but 40 women twice a day have to undress in front of a male in order to retain the privilege to do the thing that they're there to do. This boggles my mind. This is not consent. Nobody consented to that. What I, and I was saying this to Ramey the other day. What, what happened to consent culture? I thought that that was where everything was. Um, do we have another question? Yeah, here, we ha here, we have Linda Blade. Okay. <laughs> um, Linda Blade. Thank you, all four of you are just amazing. Um, can you hear me? Um, yeah, I, I just, I, I'm thinking back to when I was in university and I, whew whatever you had to deal with is, is way more than anything we did in our day. Um, so I have a question, and I, a couple questions real quick. So Riley, when you said that that media request was forwarded, and then you got that reply, did you ever then go ahead and go back to the original request and just go ahead and do it anyway? Yeah, that's, that's the defiancy I was talking about. <laughs> I did. <laughs> Um, I very quickly let her know that was not my intention of forwarding you the request. That was never something that had been discussed. Um, therefore, essentially, I was ignoring. I'm going to ignore you, I told her. Um, and since then, and I know this is coming from the administration, because since then, she's reached out to me personally several times and applauded me for what I'm doing. So I know this wasn't her, and I know this wasn't her feelings, and I, and I really like her. I know this was coming from the administration for those reasons. Which leads me to my final question. Um, do you think all of that had any impact on the NC2A at all? Like, are, are they going to change, do you think, at all? The NCAA has now taken um, entirely a hands-off approach. So, Cowards. So basically they're showing now, we knew this before, but they're showing now that they're spineless. Um, <laughs> they're taking a hands-off approach, and so what they're doing is they're phasing out. I think there's three or four or something phases to where um, they're going to leave it up to each sport's specific governing body. So swimming would ultimately be governed by USA Swimming and FINA and, and those regulations because the NCAA wants no hands in this. And that tells you again that they know it's wrong. When they want to remove themselves, they know that it's not ethical. They know that it's not fair. And, and that's why they're ridding themselves of the responsibility. If they really stood by what happened, if they really stood by how they acted, they would stand by it, right? just like Target hasn't done, just like Bud Light has not done, who's now introducing these really awesome camo cans and they have these burly <laughs> men on motorcycles riding around. They're not standing by what they're doing because they know it's wrong. And they know that the majority of people, regardless of political affiliation, regardless of where you fall on that spectrum, the majority of people know this is wrong and they know that too. Um, and Kim and Marshy can attest to this. There was an NCAA, um, conference where they were announcing their NCAA Woman of the Year, which was an award that I was nominated for. And I was so honored when I was nominated for this because this is the most prestigious award for a collegiate female athlete. It's something that encompasses your athletic achievement, um, 
but also your academics, which I was the SEC Scholar Athlete of the Year, but also your community service, which is something that I am still incredibly passionate about, and I was also the SEC Community Service Leader of the Year, which means I threw a lot of scholarship money away. Um, but anyways, I, I was so honored to receive this nomination for NCAA Woman of the Year, to which was not exclusive to just women, because University of Pennsylvania nominated Leah Thomas as their, their sole pick but of, of their whole athletic department for NCAA Woman of the Year. And so we went to this conference, but of course we did not go in support. Um, we were able to, with the help of ICONS and a coalition of other groups, um, it, it was really phenomenal. And again, these are groups who, who lean all along that political spectrum. It was really powerful because I think, and it, that shows how this really is a unifying issue, unlike you would probably guess if you saw it in the media. Um, but we were able to directly hand the NCAA hand to hand. This is the farthest still anyone has gotten to, to conversing with the NCAA about this. Hand to hand, a petition with nearly, I think, 11,000 signatures garnered in just a few days telling the NCAA to stop discriminating against women. And on top of that, ICONS issued a legal demand letter um, which told them that if they don't stop discriminating on the basis of sex, which again is what the law implements, um, Title IX, then there would be legal action. Um, but at this conference, we icons ultimately ended up buying a, a booth in this convention hall that they had. I applied with my name. Um, I had been outspoken at this point, um, denied. I was like, oh, that's weird. I'm trying to give you $2,000. Um, I applied again, denied. And then, of course, icons stepped in and, and they were able to get a booth. And so, um, we passed out pamphlets and, and little bracelets talking about Title IX and every single athletic director, because again, this was a, a large scale convention, all athletic directors and, and chancellors and presidents of universities were there. And every single athletic director who walked by, we would tell them, you know, why we're here, what we're advocating for, and they would say, thank you for doing what you're doing. You know, keep fighting. You know, this is great, we support you, in, in a whispering tone, right? And as, I, at least this is how I felt, I felt like the first six years or so, I was super encouraged. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is awesome. Everyone agrees. But then as it only continued, I began to, I think we all began to feel frustrated. If we're all on the same page, where is the discrepancy? Why are we catering to the minority if we all really feel the same here? And that's when we began asking the question of why. And, and Marcy and Kim, they would say, okay, that's great. Would you be willing to say so publicly? Oh, no. Uh, we can't have lawsuits. Uh, you know, I have a family. I can't lose my job. And then would very quickly turn and, and walk away and alleviate themselves from the conversation entirely. Um, and so I think that shows how this pressure, this social external pressure, isn't just on athletes. Um, it is on the administrators. It is on the coaches. It is on, I think, even the president of the NCAA, Mark Emmert, who pu pro uh, publicly released a statement in the following days of that national championships and said, word for word, and I remember it because it's hilarious, he said, I unequivocally stand in my decision to allow Leah Thomas to swim with the women because it's based in evolving science. <laughs> <laughs> but privately, at this same conference, um, to our group of women, he says, keep doing what you're doing. And now he's stepped down, and, I, and I, I have to imagine that maybe he's realized, maybe his moral compass is returning, and he's ultimately ashamed of himself, is what I'm hoping. Not that I'm hoping he's ashamed, but I actually am. Um, well, he should be ashamed of himself. Yes. I mean, this is what I was saying before about people who publicly say the thing that makes them popular and privately say supportive things to the people who aren't. And that has got to stop. We all have to encourage, and one of the ways we have to do this is we have to be the support. We have to put together groups like this. Icons is so amazing. Uh, but we each individually need to have a group of people who will come to the rescue, who will be, when somebody's being attacked, who will be the people who will stand behind them and stand with them and stand aside and say, we are with you. It is psychologically damaging to give women the message that they don't matter. It is psychologically damaging. This is a, an arena that's supposed to develop leaders. And at Kentucky, 
a leader was able to do what a leader is supposed to do because the leader was given the room to lead. But in these other arenas, in other schools, these potential leaders are being shut down. It is undermining female empowerment and self-confidence and leadership to tell women to shut up. We have got to make it stop. The governing bodies in women's sports have to enact policies that will make it stop. It has to be fair competition. We have to protect women's mental health. We have to protect women's dignity. We cannot subject women in sports or anywhere to these kinds of mental manipulations that make women susceptible to being subjugated again. I'm sorry, I'm like, I'm so. Um, we are out of time. So um, I just want to thank Dr. McMillan and all of these amazing athletes.